Good evening aspirants. We have an announcement regarding pre-storming 2021 program of Shankar IAS Academy. It is the prelims test series for upcoming UPSC preliminary exam 2021. We are happy to announce that Shankar IAS Academy has started admissions for the second test batch and the test is starting from 11 December 2020. Our pre-storming program is India's first full-fledged artificial intelligence supported preliminary test series. All the required details of pre-storming 2021 are provided in the description of the video and also in the comment section. With this, let's move on to the Hindi news analysis for the day 9th December 2020. These are the list of news articles chosen for today's analysis. It has been provided along with the page numbers of different editions of Hindu newspaper. Now let us take this first article for discussion. This discussion is based on this news article which is based on the recent news that hundreds of people in the Eluru town of Andhra Pradesh have fallen sick due to an undiagnosed illness. So the aims of Delhi that is the All India Institute of Medical Sciences has conducted a preliminary research and in its preliminary report traces of heavy metals such as lead and nickel have been found in several blood samples collected from the patients and these results indicate lead content and nickel content in drinking water or milk could be a possible reason behind people falling ill So in this context today let us discuss in detail about the heavy metal poisoning and its impacts the syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference see as you know the periodic table or the mendeleev's periodic table organizes chemical elements according to their atomic number electron configuration and valence numbers and based on this the modern periodic table was adopted and here you can see that these elements have been classified and the ones in this light green color they represent the metals Actually there are various definitions for heavy metals and many are based on specific gravity. You just know that the main heavy metals are beryllium, aluminum, chromium, manganese, iron, nickel, copper, lead and tin etc. So what is this heavy metal poisoning? It refers to the situation when there is excessive exposure to a heavy metal and it affects the normal function of the body. In medical usage heavy metals are loosely defined and they include all toxic metals irrespective of their atomic weight. So heavy metal poisoning can possibly include excessive amounts of iron, manganese, aluminum, mercury or even the semi metal such as arsenic. But here know that according to WHO the definition of heavy metal poisoning excludes bismuth because of its low toxicity. So why heavy metal poisoning is a serious problem? It is because some of them are dangerous to health, some of them are dangerous to the environment and some may even cause corrosion and some are harmful in other ways. But on the other hand some heavy metals have essential roles for human health while others are carcinogenic that is they can cause cancer or they are toxic see for example if you take copper it is an integral part of numerous enzymes including uh, ferrooxidase cytochrome c oxidase and others in our body it plays a role in iron metabolism melanin synthesis and central nervous system function and approximately the adult body contains 50 to 120 mg of copper and in our body high concentrations of copper are found in liver brain heart spleen and kidney and similarly we can also find the use of selenium and chromium in our body and that is why we told that heavy metals also have essential roles for human health so even though it has some important roles in human health many of them are poisonous carcinogenic or toxic and there is also another heavy metal concern which is the heavy metal pollution it can arise from many sources but most commonly it arises from the purification of metals for example during the smelting of copper and the preparation of nuclear fuels heavy metal pollution occurs and how this heavy metal pollution occurs see for example you would have heard about electroplating simply just know that electroplating is the process of coating with metal by means of an electric current and this electroplating is the primary source of chromium and cadmium and through the precipitation of their compounds or by ion exchange into soils and muds the heavy metal pollutants can localize and they lay inactive in the soil and mud and here the main issue is the heavy metals do not decay like the organic pollutants and therefore they pose a different kind of challenge for remediation Now coming to human exposure to these heavy metals it may occur through diet from medications from the environment or also in the course of work or play heavy metals can enter the body through the skin or by inhalation or by ingestion and the toxicity due to these heavy metals can result from sudden exposure severe exposure or even from chronic exposure over time 
for example if your work involves the use of heavy metals that means you will be exposed to that heavy metal for a longer period of time now what are the health effects of these heavy metal poisoning it affects the central nervous system the kidneys liver skins bones or even teeth but if we discuss about the symptoms it can vary depending on the metal that is involved or the amount of that metal that is absorbed and the age of the person who is exposed to that heavy metal for example young children are more susceptible to the effects of lead exposure because they absorb more compared to adults but there are also some common symptoms like nausea vomiting diarrhea abdominal pain these are some common symptoms of acute metal ingestion and if there is chronic exposure that is persistent exposure then it may also cause various symptoms like damage to body organs or it may also increase the risk of cancer and the treatment to such poisoning depends on the circumstances of the exposure now today we are discussing about lead poisoning and nickel poisoning as you know lead is a naturally occurring toxic metal found in earth's crust it has widespread use which has resulted in extensive environmental contamination human exposure and even significant public health problems in many parts of the world now let us see what are the important sources of environmental contamination caused by lead it include mining smelting manufacturing and recycling activities and in some countries still they use leaded paint leaded gasoline and leaded aviation fuel and it is also used for the manufacture of lead acid batteries for motor vehicles apart from this lead is also used in many other products for example pigments paints solder stained glass lead crystal glassware ammunition ceramic glazes jewelry toys and in some cosmetics and traditional medicines Additionally the drinking water that is delivered through lead pipes or pipes that is joined with lead solder may also contain lead and the toxic effects of lead leads to profound and permanent adverse health effects in young children particularly it affects the development of their brain and nervous system lead can also cause long term harm in adults like increased risk of high blood pressure and kidney damage and if pregnant women are exposed to lead to high levels then it can cause miscarriage stillbirth premature birth and low birth weight but know that lead exposure is preventable like for example we can stop the usage of uh, leaded paints leaded gasolines we can stop using the products that contain lead etc but according to who there is no level of exposure to lead that is known to be without harmful effects that means even small amounts of lead exposure will have some harmful effects so it is better not to use the products that contain lead Now coming to nickel as you know nickel is a hard silvery white metal and it causes irritation and exposure to nickel can harm the lungs stomach and kidneys it may also lead to cancer workers may be harmed from exposure to nickel because nickel is used in many industries it's used to make stainless steel and other metal alloys it is used to make jewelry that is the nickel coins or uh, nickel jewelry so because of this the refinery workers who work in nickel processing plants then the people who work in jewelry and pawn shop they are highly exposed to nickel so these are some of the important information that is you know with respect to heavy metal poisoning especially lead poisoning and nickel poisoning now let's move on to the next discussion this discussion is based on this news article which talks about the increasing height of mount everest the news article says that nepal and china jointly announced the new height of mount everest as 8848.86 meters so in this context let us discuss in brief about the mount everest and the himalayas as you know mount everest is the highest mountain in the world it is also known as sagarmatha in nepal and komolungma in china It is a mountain on the crest of Great Himalayas that lies on the border between Nepal and the Tibet Autonomous Region of China. So how these Himalayas were created which eventually led to the creation of Mount Everest. See these tall or lofty Himalayas are one of the most dramatic and visible creations of plate tectonic forces. This immense mountain range began to form between 40 and 50 million years ago. It began to form when two large land masses that is the Indian plate and Eurasian plate they collided. They collided due to the plate movement. Now this happened because both these continental land masses that is the Indian plate and Eurasian plate they both have about the same rock density so one plate could not be subducted under the another and this created a lot of pressure on these impinging plates and this could only be relieved by thrusting skyward that is the earth's crust started pushing upwards and there was also contorting or twisting along the collision zone and this eventually formed the himalayan peaks with rough sharp points 
See, about two twenty-five million years ago, India was a large island that was situated off the Australian coast. The vast ocean, called as the Tethys Sea, separated India from the Asian continent. But when the supercontinent Pangaea broke apart about two hundred million years ago, India began to move northward. And about eighty million years ago, India was located roughly six thousand four hundred kilometers south of the Asian continent, and it was also moving northward at a rate of about nine meter per century. And as a result of this, the Indian plate rammed into Asia about forty to fifty million years ago. And after this, India's northward advancement slowed by about half. This collision and the associated decrease in rate of plate movement are interpreted to mark the beginning of the rapid upliftment of Himalayas. Thus, the Himalayas and the Tibetan Plateau have risen very rapidly, and in just fifty million years, peaks such as Mount Everest have risen to the heights of about nine kilometer. And even yet, the impinging of these two land masses have not come to an end. The Himalayas continue to rise more than one centimeter per year. That is, there is a growth rate of ten kilometer in a million years in the Himalayas. And at present, the movement of India continues to put enormous pressure on the Asian continent. In turn, Tibet also presses on the land masses to the north. So the net effect of these uh, enormous pressure and of the plate tectonic forces that is acting on this geologically complicated region is expected to squeeze parts of Asia eastward, that is towards the Pacific Ocean. And these tremendous stresses build up within the Earth's crust is relieved periodically by earthquakes along the numerous faults. Even some of the world's most destructive earthquakes in history are related to the continuing tectonic processes that began some 50 million years ago when the Indian plate and Eurasian continents first met. So this is the beautiful story of how the Himalayas and the Mount Everest formed and as a result of this continuing impinging of these two land masses now again the height of Mount Everest has increased from 8848 meters to 8848.86 meters so these are some of the points that you should know with respect to Mount Everest now let's move on to the next discussion this discussion is based on this editorial article which talks about Khalistan movement The Khalistan movement is in news because recently terrorists were arrested in New Delhi who are suspected to be the killers of Shaurya Chakra Awardi Balwinder Singh. So this incident has turned the spotlight on the long dead and buried Khalistan movement. So in today's discussion we will see in detail about this movement. The syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference. So what is this Khalistan movement? It is the movement seeking a separate homeland for Sikhs. Khalistan can be divided into two words Khalsa plus Stan that is a homeland for the Sikh community that is the Khalsa community they want Punjab as a separate country for Sikhs so how this movement started as you know the partition resulted in division of Indian and Punjab province into the Muslim majority Punjab and then Hindu and Sikh majority Punjab so as a result of this India lost some of territories of Punjab to Pakistan and this made the Sikhs of Punjab unhappy So later the political party of Punjab Akali Dal wanted a Sikh subah or a Sikh province based on the Sikh majority population in Punjab they wanted the Sikh province to regain the lost prominence due to partition and for this Akali Dal passed the Anandpur Sahib resolution this resolution asked the government to constitutionally recognize Punjab as an autonomous state that would strive to safeguard Sikhism and Sikh rights as a fundamental state policy and as a result of this in addition to much protests in the year 1966 the punjab with sikh majority became a separate state along with haryana and himachal pradesh but the real problem started when the punjab province was trifurcated into punjab haryana and himachal pradesh and in this the major issue was that the waters of river ravi and bias were shared among these three states and in this only 23 percentage of water went to punjab while the remaining was used by the other two states so this created agitations among the sikh community along with this there were also other reasons for their agitation such as chandigarh is not solely owned by punjab rather it is being shared with haryana and then sikhism is not getting its due recognition and sikhs are being referred to as hindu under the constitution of india and they also have a general feeling that the union government of india treats them with a step motherly treatment and in addition to all these one of the issues which did not receive much attention from the government was the lack of industry employment in punjab see after the green revolution in punjab which flourished the agriculture many expected that employment for youth in the state will increase but it did not happen so so the unemployed youth gathered to become militants of the khalistan movement 
After this happened the major event of entry of Sant Bindran Wale that is Sant Jarnail Singh Ji Bindran Wale. See Akali Dal represented the moderate faction of Sikh demands while the faction led by Sant Bindran Wale represented the extremist faction. And Sant Bindran Wale was an orthodox religious leader who encouraged the Sikhs to lead a much committed faithful religious and dedicated way of life. But however due to the prevailing social and economic situation in Punjab he gained popularity which made him to lead one of the bloodiest militant movements in Indian soil which was the Khalistan movement so what were the demands of Sant Bindran Wale and the Khalistan movement first they wanted larger share of irrigation waters from Ravi and Bias second they wanted Chandigarh back to Punjab and third they demanded constitutional changes with regard to Sikhs who were being classified as Hindus under article 25 clause 2 sub clause B but the government of India initially did not act much on these demands so the Sikh militants started a streak of assassination robbery and kidnapping even they started using golden temple as their base and they were carrying out extremist activities against the state this eventually led to the much known operation which is the operation blue star where the indian army stormed into the holiest shrine for sikhs and famously known as the golden temple and started gun fight with the militants inside the gurudwara and as a result of this eventually in this battle sant bindran wale was killed along with majority of his militants however this led to assassination of a prime minister indira gandhi as you remember because she ordered this operation blue star to happen in the golden temple as a result of this only she was killed by her own sikh bodyguards and this led to the 1984 anti sikh riots across north india to avenge the death of indira gandhi thousands of sikhs were killed and later for a lasting peace the then prime minister rajiv gandhi and another sikh leader sant longowal came together and they signed the rajiv longowal accord but this even did not ensure lasting peace because many sections of sikhs did not accept this accord and even later longowal was also assassinated and such assassinations continued where the extremist groups killed all those who supported the peace accord and in fact they even hijacked one air indian flight in the year 1981 and they even blew up another flight in 1985 and finally the militancy in punjab came to an end under the leadership of kps gill who was given the task of putting an end to the militancy in punjab this was one of the reason why militancy came to an end in punjab the other reasons include the lack of clear idea of what khalistan movement movement actually constitutes even among its superior leaders and second reason was there was a loss of support from the educated sikh youths and thirdly government formulated policies which led to the socio economic development of punjab so as a result of all these the militancy in punjab came to an end and so did the khalistan movement in india and currently many experts say that there is no sympathy for khalistan movement among the vast sections of sikh youth but now there are also reports that pakistan's intelligence agency that is isi is trying to revive this khalistan movement and for this isi is targeting the sikh diaspora in europe and north america so that they can bring devastation to the sikh community and also to india so this is one of the important topics in indian history and we do not get many instances to discuss this so you can take this opportunity to know about this khalistan movement and the important developments after it now let's move on to the next discussion this discussion is based on this oped article which focuses on the various opportunities that is open to the indian economy in the field of artificial intelligence and in this oped article author talks about the right approach to make the best use of such opportunity so now let us discuss these aspects before that the syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference first let us have a brief learning about the concepts of artificial intelligence and machine learning Artificial intelligence can be defined as an effort of humans to replicate their own cognitive capabilities in machines. It is an entire field of study that is oriented around the developing of computing systems which are capable of performing tasks that otherwise requires human intelligence. Or in other words we can say that artificial intelligence is the developing of computing systems to be capable of performing the tasks without the need for human intelligence but on the same lines of human intelligence thus ai promises better future but its sustainability lies on the smart skills of programmers So what about its economic impact the economic impact of artificial intelligence is based on the idea that advances in artificial intelligence will benefit humans to the extent where benefits will be more significant than the costs of reliance on ai for machine driven decision making 
Now, since the benefits are more than the cost of reliance on AI, its economic impact is also projected to be more. But however, the key to such a future lies in the right preparation. And we will see what is this right preparation later in this discussion. So in simple terms, artificial intelligence is a broader concept where machines are being able to carry out tasks in a smart way. So what about machine learning? Machine learning can be defined as an application of artificial intelligence that is based around the idea of giving machines the access to data and allowing them to learn themselves. Machine learning applications can be used to read text. It can be used to analyze its content. For example, machine learning can recognize whether the person who wrote a text is making a complaint or is offering congratulations. It can also listen to a piece of music and decide whether it is likely to make someone happy or sad and it can find other pieces of music to match the same mood. And in some cases, machine learning can even compose their own music that express the same themes or which it knows is likely to be appreciated by the admirers of the original piece. From this, you would have understood that in machine learning, it takes the data and allows itself to learn from that data and even provide suggestions based on that. So based on the importance of artificial intelligence, machine learning and their scope, author discusses about the government initiatives and investments that have contributed for the progress in the field of AI capability building. Particularly, author has talked about Niti Aayog's national strategy. See, after recognizing artificial intelligence potential to transform economies, the Union Finance Minister mandated Niti Aayog to establish the national program on artificial intelligence. It was mandated in the budget speech for 2018 to 2019 with a view to guide the research and development in the new and emerging technologies. So as a result of this, Niti Aayog has adopted a three-pronged approach. In this, the first approach includes undertaking of exploratory proof of concept AI projects in various areas. So when we say proof of concept, it means getting evidence from an experiment or pilot project which demonstrates that a design concept is feasible. And the second approach is crafting a national strategy for building a vibrant artificial intelligence ecosystem in India. And the third strategy is collaborating with various experts and stakeholders in this regard. So based on this three-pronged approach, since the start of 2018, Niti Aayog has partnered with several leading artificial intelligence technology players to implement the AI projects in critical areas such as agriculture and health. And under the National Program on Artificial Intelligence, Niti Aayog has envisaged AI for all concept, that is artificial intelligence for all. It is for inclusive growth and it identifies various focus areas for AI-led solutions for social impact such as healthcare, agriculture, education, smart cities and infrastructure, smart mobility and transportation, etc. So this is one of the important initiatives of the government. Now, after this, author talks about the greater role played by artificial intelligence and machine learning across various sectors during this pandemic times. In the pandemic, AI and ML have supplemented the role of various individual professionals because, as you know, lockdown has further boosted the Internet usage among people. And high internet usage has caused huge data generation. So this paves way for development of artificial intelligence because it needs loads of data to build its intelligence. In addition to this, various policies and strategies of states and private firms have focused on AI adoption to create solutions for global clients. For example, Telangana Police used artificial intelligence enabled automated number plate recognition software to catch violations. Apart from this, now even startups are focusing on artificial intelligence and they are focusing to find solutions in areas like cancer screening, smart farming and conversational AI for the use of enterprises. You can take the example of uh, Niramai and RISO. Niramai stands for uh, Non-Invasive Risk Assessment with Machine Intelligence. It has developed an early breast cancer detection technology and this technology is radiation free and it is non-invasive. And Rezo is an AI-powered platform that automates conversations over voice, emails, WhatsApp, social media and chats. So based on this, we can say that development in the field of artificial intelligence not only helps us in solving business problems, but it also helps us to find solutions to complex social issues. And now since startups are focusing on AI as well, there is increase in the human resources in the field of artificial intelligence. And based on this, author envisages that India is having a potential for an AI economy and India will eventually become the artificial intelligence powerhouse of the world. 
and this view of author is supplemented by a nascom report which is titled as unlocking value from data and ai this report mentions the upcoming impact of role of artificial intelligence in indian economy where india's contributions will mainly arise from three main segments or sectors and these include consumer goods and retail agriculture and then banking and insurance apart from that the report also noted that data and ai could add around 500 billion to india's gdp by the year 2025 so that means developing of artificial intelligence field has greater economic value for india because it will also lead to employment generation here author projects that the growing artificial intelligence economy is estimated to create over 20 million technical roles alone it is because ai has the capability to create solutions for specific problems as well as solutions for better governance and social impact and currently ai is already used in the indian governance in the fields of law enforcement education defense ecosystem mapping and also to discharge some government functions thus it is sure that we are going to witness enormous growth in the field of ai and machine learning and based on this potential author has suggested three areas that must be focused to grab hold of the upcoming opportunities in the artificial intelligence to develop our indian economy the first and foremost focus should be given to talent and skill development because right talent is the best way to approach the upcoming opportunities thus there is a need to enhance the speed to develop our workforce and the next focus should be on the policies and these policies should be aimed at the areas of uh, data usage governance and security since without data there is no existence of artificial intelligence therefore author suggests to develop a suitable approach to control and balance the generated data and such approach should lead to a government framework that governs data and that governs its ethical usage and the third area that needs to be focused is the need for increased development of digitization digitization is the conversion of text pictures or sound into a digital form that can be processed by a computer this need arises because currently there is a mismatch between the level of digitization and the usage of digital technologies when there is low level of digitization there is not enough training data available to run the artificial intelligence or uh, machine learning or algorithms so it impacts the accuracy of the results produced by ai and ml and that is why digitization is important in this context now along with these three focus areas author also stresses on the need for clean data sets as a conclusion see clean data means a data which is complete accurate and which does not need any modification or replacing and data analysis should take place only after the data has been cleaned because it is important that the results of our analysis to be built on accurate data and strong data and such clean data or clean data sets improves the performance and outcomes of ai models thus author suggests as a conclusion that the organizations should invest in data management frameworks in order to clean the data so these strategies can be used by the government to convert india's potential into reality and we can make the best use of available potential in the field of artificial intelligence and machine learning so these are some of the points that you should know with respect to this concept now let's move on to the next discussion Our next discussion is based on this editorial article. In this article, author talks about a report called as Updated Science-Wide Author Databases of Standardized Citation Indicators. It was prepared by a professor and scientist of Stanford University in USA. So based on this report, author talks about what the report says about India regarding the performance of Indian scientists. So today let us see what this report is all about and also the important points mentioned by author. See discussing this topic becomes important because we can see that in recent times there are deliberations over academic freedom and there are even criticism that government is not spending enough on research. So now a report has placed scientists across the world based on their performance. So we'll have an idea about whether Indian scientists have a good position across the world or not. Now first know that this report is an updated database of standardized citation metrics across all scientists and scientific disciplines. When we say citation it means a formal reference to a published or unpublished source from where we obtain information while writing our research paper. And citation metrics which is also known as bibliometrics it means the extent to which a research paper is cited in other pieces of academic work such as the extent to which it has been cited in other papers theses dissertations or texts so these citation metrics are referenced as conclusive evidence of academic quality by research journals they are also used as evidence of top academic performance 
see so your research paper will be cited only if the research paper is good and the results obtained in that research paper is valid so that means the citation metrics will tell us the quality of such research so accordingly this report provides updated analysis that use citations from citation database called as scopus the report assesses scientists for career long citation impact and this database is based on the number of research paper published the number of times the author has been cited and it is also based on the h index h index is a measure of the impact of an author's work so this is the basics about this report now what's the position of india according to the author of this editorial from india around 1500 indians have made it to the list of uh, top 2 percentage scientists in the world that is the top 2 percentage scientists in the world include 1594 indian scientists the report says that in the list of top scientists the scientists from uh, government supported institutions have shown supremacy in the disciplines of science and technology whereas the scientists from private institutions they have found place in the disciplines of medicine and allied areas the report also mentions that more than 4 fifths of the scientists in india in the list are from government supported institution so this shows the freedom flexibility and facilitation to the faculty in these government supported institution to carry out research on any relevant topic and with respect to private institutions scientists find mention in this report regarding the medicine discipline and its allied areas and this points to the need for reorienting and taking a relook at the investment in research and development by government medical institutions that means government medical institution should also take lead in medical and allied areas the report also shows an equitable distribution of scientists working in institutions in urban areas and rural areas so according to the author this could act as a great incentive to many rising scientists from the rural areas so these are some of the important points that you can take from this editorial now let's move on to the next discussion Now we have come to the last session the practice questions discussion session this first question asks consider the following chemical elements iron nickel copper lead beryllium which of the above elements have the potential to cause heavy metal poisoning say so actually all of these have the potential to cause heavy metal poisoning additionally aluminum chromium manganese also have the same ability so the correct answer to this question is option d 1 2 3 4 and 5 Now this next question is about Himalayas. First statement: Himalayan peaks were formed due to the collision of two large land masses, India and Eurasia, due to plate movement. This statement is correct. Second statement: The net effect of plate tectonic forces in Himalayan regions squeezes parts of Asia eastward toward the Pacific Ocean. This statement is also correct. Third statement: Even today, the Himalayas continue to rise more than 10 cm a year. This statement is incorrect. Himalayas grows more than 1 cm a year, not 10 cm. And here the question asks for the correct statements. So the correct answer is option B, one and two only. Now this question asks: Recently, a report called "Updated Science-Wide Author Databases of Standardized Citation Indicators" was seen in news. The database gives worldwide details on number of research papers published, the number of times the author has been cited, and the measure of the impact of an author's work. With reference to this report, consider the following statements: In India, more than four fifths of the scientists who made to the top of the list are from private institutions. This statement is incorrect. According to the report, more than four fifths of the scientists in the list are from the government supported institutions second statement is according to the report there is an equitable distribution of scientists working in institutions in urban and rural areas this statement is correct and here the question asks for the correct statements so the correct answer is option b two only now let us take one main question based on gs paper 3 can it be said that militant khalistan movement which wreaked havoc in india in the 80s and 90s is raising its ugly head in india again discuss elaborately how this is detrimental for india's growth and vision in the long term you have to answer this question in 250 words you can write the answer and post it in the comment section with this we come to the end of today's hindi news analysis if you like the video don't forget to like comment and share and do subscribe to shankar ais academy youtube channel for more updates related to civil service examination preparation